Hi friends, it's Eric here. Let's talk with famous people. And I have with me a person who I knew previously as Northern Goshawk. <laughs> <laughs> but his name in this particular conversation is Legomorph NG. So uh, that's just to formally introduce everybody. Um, What's going on? How you doing? Uh, I mean, not too bad. Just you're breaking up a little bit, but that's all right. All right, I'll turn so, off my camera. It's fine. I'll turn off my camera. It's because my wife's got a client, and she's probably streaming music for them and uh, stuff. And I don't know. Regardless, uh, welcome and nice to meet you. And we had talked before all this evolution throwdown stuff went went going on. <laughs> Uh, we had talked about some cognitive function stuff, yes? Yep. Okay, so I think, I don't remember the way this thing played out. Did you email me or something, and I emailed you back, and then we started like that? Yeah, pretty much. Like, you, you asked for people to make videos in one of your videos, so I figured I might try it. All right, great. So thank you. I appreciate you uh, taking me up on that, and that's, that offer is still out there for everybody as well. If you have any ideas you want to talk about, anything you want to do, like with a video or whatever, email me. I'm totally down. As Lagomorph slash Northern Goshawk says. Demonstrates, <laughs> I mean. Demonstrates, not says. Okay. So, let's see. What is it you wanted to talk about? I don't even remember. Um, so, I think I might be qualified enough to talk about INFJ logical structures from my perspective, at least. So, that's what I'm going to try to do. Okay. Well, let's hear it. You got the okay, floor. So, of course, I have visual aids galore. So, um, first off, we start out with SE. Um, SE just observes things. So, like, you know, each wonderful little black dot represents an observation. And what we kind of automatically do is triangulate those things to reveal hidden things. So, it kind of works similar to, like, like how, you know, an, an earthquake... Um, like, I forget the exact term, but, you know, how scientists identify where an earthquake occurs, that kind of deal. And what we do from that point is we build them on top of each other. So we'll take triangulations and stack them and just keep going and going and going until we reach like a single truth that if everything, you know, below it is, is true, then this will be true. So then we can, that what that lets us do is we can validate like this one tiny thing and then with that we'll simultaneously validate the entire rest of the system okay and so wait wait i'm oh, sorry I, it's it's mirrored it's like can you turn it over turn it the other direction like oh uh, yeah like that what? yeah that like that yeah leave, leave it like like that way right. okay so uh time it goes up so what well, process is this um, so this is everything we triangulated from our observations, and it's basically just a bunch of if-then statements. So, like, you know, so if it, our observations are correct, then this is true. Then if, if that is true, then these things are true. No, I got that, that part, but I'm saying the first paper you said was for SE. What's this paper for? Um, this is kind of where, where TI kicks in, and, and I, I don't want to I don't want to say TI because this is also kind of automatic, quote unquote, uh -huh. but. Like, it took me so long to realize that this is what was kind of going on. So, I think this is just how I describe it, I guess. I don't know. Okay, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. But, like, oh, it's cool. Then, um, I mean, I found, like, a mathematical formula that, that actually describes this. And then, like, what we can do is, uh, what? I'm trying to get this way. What's the formula? Read out the formula. Yeah. Oh, read out the formula. Yeah. Shit. It's it's basically uh, how I found it was um, basically like a factorial. Only it's not a factorial because it's it's not a product thing. It's just like the sum of all things instead of the product. So, what's that symbol? Just, that big E looking symbol. The that's a capital sigma. So the sum of all, you know, K when. Uh, fuck, I don't know. Just Google it. <laughs> okay. All right, fine. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, but anyway, like what we can do um, is, you know, apply it to observation, but we can also apply that like through time. So like if you can 
observe past events or present events, we can we can kind of predict like the most likely future outcome that's going to happen. So like, okay. So like with with this, when future observations come in, um, like we gain insight from it very quickly a lot of the time, and we reach very fast conclusions. But like a lot of the time. RTI is just so slow to catch things up. So, like, we, we, we quote unquote know that something is correct or right, but we don't necessarily know how. It takes us a while to reach that point. And then that's also why we, like, we either look like idiots or psychics, you know? Um, then, if you're good, you can build on that. So, I'm going to use some examples from ecology here. Um, all right. So this is a combination of what is called um, source sync dynamics and something called centrifugal organization. So um, in, in ecology, we have an example where we have a population of birds and they'll nest in this habitat right here. Um, say this, the plant that they build their nest in or whatever is suitable to you know, build a population so that the starting population is 100 birds you know, and by the time they're all done reproducing or whatever, there's 200 left. So next year when they come back from migration, there are 200 individuals. This, this habitat only holds 100. So the leftovers are forced into this habitat here, which is similar, but it's, it's not suitable enough. Um, and say in this habitat, the birds would otherwise breed and be happy, but there is a source of predators here. There are snakes here that eat the birds and all of these birds get eaten and so like overall there's there's like no net change really um so like this habitat would be known as a source this habitat would be known as a sink for the birds but at the same time you see centrifugal organization stemming from this so where there are birds there will be populations of snakes radi radiating outwards and then because we have a higher population of snakes here, there is in turn a higher population of predators who eat snakes like that. And say, like this habitat could initially support a population of 10 snakes, but with the birds there, then all of a sudden it can afford a, you know, support a population of 100 snakes or something like that. Um, so what I tend to do is just swap out the variables and keep all the, all the, the structures itself, so the systemic structure, I just keep the lines. So instead of birds and snakes, I turn this into, say, say our source is algae that eventually... Can you turn that around? Into, Can you turn it around? Like how? The other way, facing the other direction. This way? Yeah, like that. No. This way? Yeah, like that. Yeah, now, okay. it's, now it looks correct. Um, That's weird. Okay, so because for me it's backwards. Yeah, it works that way with my computer too. It appeared I didn't fix it automatically or something usually, but it doesn't fix it with you for some reason, I guess. Uh, huh. Okay, so that's interesting. The idea of a sink being basically the success of a population of a given species in one ideal location will produce more of that species than the location can support. <laughs> which necessitates that the extra biological produce from that once area provides like you know the the foundation for an ecosystem support boost in another area yeah um so like what i like to do with this is i like to swap out the variables and just keep the structures the same so like yeah, you know, I'll keep the lines that connect everything together in the system, but I'll I'll swap out. Say we have algae, that when it becomes you know when it's alive, it's algae. But when it dies, it you know eventually accumulates and becomes crude oil. And then around that source of crude oil that we now have, then we have uh, you know instead of you know predators and prey radiating out, we have wealth radiating out, and then that attracts you know military industrial complex, or we have. Um, People who go to school and learn information who become, you know, teachers. And then teachers are surrounded by students. And then the students, you know, go out and, and perform future accomplishments, things like that. So
so like that's that's kind of what I mean when I say like reduce something to a general systemic structure and um, then I, I kind of build on that a little more <laughs> so instead of working with like individual observations I can build structures out of holistic systems themselves and that becomes like a true factorial so like if I encounter like not even a complete system but if there's like three or four component parts of a whole system then I just like automatically fill in the rest of that system and that's like super speed um, as far as logic so I, I think how NI and TL work together it's like it's it's efficient in a way that you come to conclusions faster and those, those conclusions are, are usually accurate but it's just it just sucks because it's slow and it takes a while to like explain things to other people hmm. and I think that's all of my visual aids. So. so, okay, take a moment to distinguish that then. Contrast it against another means of... Uh, I can't hear you at all. You can't hear me? You're, you're breaking up. All right. So contrast that, if you will, against another, an alternate mode of approaching that, like, say, mine, an ENTP, or any... How is that different in ITI in the way you describe, as you understand it anyway, from the an alternative in ETI or some other alternative? Um, like from what I understand of NE, it's basically like this this complete opposite structure. It's just like everything is like its own little tree branch thing, and it just goes off and on and on. But like, here, let me draw something real quick. Like, I, I've heard you say before, like, how INFJs don't necessarily have um, a structure that, that withstands, like, interaction with NETI. Like, wh when I view that, it's like an ENTP, like, you will come in and say, hey, I made a new observation, and, and you know, that's so far from your conclusion up here that, you know, your, your system is wrong or whatever, whatever. Whereas, really, I just build on that and build on that, and I get a conclusion that's, it's not here, but it's, like, right here. So. Hmm. go in other directions but for me it's like no matter which, which path you take you're going to reach the same destination anyway so you know okay so I mean the thing is when I think about introverted intuition and extroverted intuition I think of them as as sort of working in coordination with each other except that if you're talking I can't hear you Eric, are you alive? Yeah, I'm here. I'm just refreshing. Oh, for fuck's sake. I tell you, the shit I gotta deal with is internet. Hi. Okay. Can you turn off your cameras so that we put less bandwidth uh, requirements on the thing? We just okay. talked we just so talked mic only. Were you were you able to record that red dot thing I just added? Uh sort of. But we'll go I'll talk to you about it in a just turn off your camera and then we'll have I, we don't have to worry about you you or me missing stuff because what happened there is I missed part of the section about how ENTP thought differs from INFJ thought 
So you were talking about like branching trees. If you guys show it something on the camera because you got a picture to show, great. But um, the rest of the time you just like turn it on and off as need be, okay? So okay. Uh, so if you want to re-explain that and if you got a picture or whatever, let's, let's go ahead and do that because I want to make sure I got what you were saying. Okay, so for me, the way I perceive any is it's just like the complete opposite. So like any people will, will come in and, and you know they'll say well this observation contradicts the rest of your structure and, and yada 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 whereas i just build their observation into my structure and the end conclusion isn't that far off from my you know my initial conclusion um so you fill in the structure after drawing the conclusion well i i i've I, I, i've I've described NI before as pre-creational. It's knowledge before you could possibly have worked it out, right? Because I've had moments of NI, as everybody does, um, and it may be explicable, but sometimes it's not explicable because the the dynamics of it are too complex. So it's like if you say, well, why is this song better than that song? You might know intuitively that one is better than the other, it might be difficult to explain it. Yeah, like for me, I'll I'll know something's better or I'll know something's true or you know something like that. But a lot of the time, I just lack the labels and the words to describe it. So, like I have this visual in my head, I just cannot put it in the words for the life of me. All right, so can we see the red dot paper and what you got going on with the red dot? Okay. So. I have no idea if it's backwards or not, but it's backwards. Like say, okay, but yeah, say this is the new observation, and I just incorporate that into this, and you know, what if it doesn't incorporate? It does. It always does. It always does. Okay. I find a way. Well, well, basically, what it is. Um, so imagine it's it's kind of like playing Tetris. But it's like playing Tetris in a suitcase. So it's like you're you're working with a bunch of unique shapes that there's only one possible way that they can fit into the suitcase, and it has to be that way. And that's kind of how I incorporate things into that larger super system. So there's always a way. You just have to find it, and it, it just takes a little work to get there. Hmm. I'm trying to think of how I would visually describe any. It's... I mean, it's a leap of faith, is what it is. Like, I was... I, before you came in here, or before I came in here even, I was um, singing and rapping, just sort of freestyle vocals over a uh, beat. And when any is going well, as it was during that particular instance of it, at a creative level anyway it's like you're just floating and you have to not use any effort almost it's like you just let the thing hit you as you're moving along so you'll say a word and then the the rhyme will pop into your head that you want to use and you just you just got to roll it into a little narrative that unfolds as if they're coming out and stuff but if you try to if you try to ideate it doesn't work it's, you got to let go, you know. It's very much a uh, a learning to be learning to willlessly associate while concurrently working a narrative consciously. So part of it is willed. The part that gets you from rhyme to rhyme basically is willed, and then the part that produces the rhymes and stuff is not. It just sort of pops into your head when you need it. But the same thing is true of argumentation. It's like when I'm arguing in the moment. I, it's just whatever, whatever the answer is, or whatever the the best response to a given argument is, it's going to be, it's just sort of coming to my head abruptly. It's not like, it's not like I have any any real control over anything. It's an odd way to be, I guess. It's like, I don't know how much control anybody else does either. Yeah, like it sounds like you're talking about basically like speaking in tongues or something. Yeah, kind of. You gotta let the spirit overcome you. <laughs> yeah. uh, but in in general, in life, like 
it's interesting seeing Kimberly not have good any and what that looks like. And working with this kid, Aaron, who has polar any and what that looks like. This kid, Aaron, is actually extremely intelligent. He got a proof score on the ACT. He, uh, he's he got like 11 AP classes. He got one B all of high school. And um, if you were to sit down and talk with him, you'd think he was dumb as, dumb as a bucket of rocks. <laughs> he's got nothing to say. He's got no ideas coming out of him. He's just ideationally dead. But he's still very smart. And it's a weird contradiction because we typically, I think, as intuitives, think that intelligence, quote-unquote, equals intuitive, quote-unquote, basically. Because, uh, you know, ISTPs don't sound smart. And we're their supervisor types. ENTPs are, anyway. Uh, so, regardless, the, the point is that the... Any is built on the assumption that wherever you are, at whatever moment in in a in a narrative, that you can always shift gears. You can always change it to something else. That's not really true, and it's something that ENTPs have a lot of difficulty coming to terms with over the years. It's like, okay, what I know I can do, and what I think I might do, and what I actually will do, are different things. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's let's begin to wrap up this video about uh, INFJ uh, functions. So I think your point is that there's a matrix of some sort of interlocking components that uh, that form a conditional whole that is logically sound, but that you. Yeah. don't attain via direct conditional logic processes. Yeah, it's like every every new thing that we observe just gets, it's just used to validate and verify every other thing that we already know. And like, I, I think that INFJs are kind of associated with social things, um, but it's not necessarily because it's an emotional thing for us. It's because that people are just massive storehouses of information, and it's just really, really efficient for us to use them that way. You know. Well, I mean, the thing is, what you're talking about highlights the distinction between metaphysical and physical epistemologies. I think so. What you're talking about is made feasible with NI. Because NI renders every experience into a symbolic representation of it of some sort. And what you're saying is NI is particularly good at taking at taking complex holes and meaning packing them down into nodes, which then can be dealt with as nodes rather than as as messy complex holes. So um, that that makes sense. It makes perfectly good sense that, that would be the case. And the the challenge, I guess, for INFJ then would be, what to do? What do you do with things that don't tie in very well to the rest of the things you got going on? Like, do you simply reject those pieces of knowledge? How do you incorporate more uh, less representable kinds of knowledge, like introverted sensing kind of knowledge, your own experiences, your own memories, your own physical state of being? And hunger and thirst and stuff like that. So, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, so, like in general, just if it's if it's something new, like if I can't already relate it to a pre-existing systemic structure that I could use to light up the rest of the system, I'll just try to learn as much as I can about it, or learn, you know, about something else entirely that might relate to it, and just form a new system around it. And then, when it comes to things like SI and remembering things. Um, just the whole reminiscing and nostalgia thing. Um, I don't. I. I kind of have trouble building like building it into something. I. I know I experience it, and I. You know, like. I know when I'm experiencing it in, in real time, but. I don't necessarily. Like relive experiences. I don't know. That's interesting. I've heard another INFJ in the past refer to 
essay stuff as nostalgia and say about himself, I'm just not very nostalgic. It's uh, it's such a distinct worldview than an SI user who would say, he wouldn't consider that nostalgic in any sense, would consider that critical to who they are and how they understand who they are as their good keeping of their own personal memories and stuff. I tend to be more aligned with kind of an NI approach, but uh, I'm still an SI user, but I mean, it's like, because it's my fifth slot, NI is my fifth slot, I do a lot of things that operate in that domain. So, you know, it's it's probably more comfortable as, a, as an abstract epistemology for me to work with NI stuff for sure, and for physical stuff, obviously maybe more, it's going to be SI, but anyhow, um, okay, so I've, I've said in the past that ENTP and INFJ are the most two most metaphysical types, and that INFJ is more metaphysical than ENTP, and the reason I've said that is because a knowledge function is more of a metaphysical function than is an action function. So I, I'm not exactly sure how I'm comparing the two, but I would say that um, what you're describing, noting out everything all the time, is an interesting combination of TI and uh, NI, with, with FE going into the mix as follows. I think that FE is foremost a, a reflexive reaction to... Um, to a problem one faces. If one faces a real problem in the world, not a puzzle, like uh, cognitive functions, but a real problem, like I gotta fix the refrigerator door, Effie always looks to somebody else to help solve that problem as a default. It reflexively does so. And TE looks to solve it yourself without asking for anybody's help. So a heavy TE user might be inefficient, for example, in failing to ask for somebody's help when he really needs it although he'll probably get the hang of that one pretty early on. Whereas an FE user might fail to take care of something that they can easily enough take care of themselves because they're habitually asking others to help them. Of course, because they're habitually asking others to help them, they have to have good FE, which means they, they've they got to be smooth about everything and they got to keep track of that shit. So it nodes out pretty easy if you think about it as its purpose of um, managing social capital, so to speak. Thoughts? Um, I mean, I, I pretty much agree with that. Um, I mean, I don't know. I, I just see, like, the cognitive functions themselves as, as a heuristic that is consistent. So, like, even though I'm, like, experiencing the world subjectively, that the, the subjectivity itself, that heuristic, is, has been consistent the whole time, I guess. So. Well, um, the only sub- intersubjectivity... Like you're, comparing with other people, that's the thing. You're acting subjectively, but everything else in your attentional span, this conscious is regularly anyway, is objective. You know objectively. I know subjectively. But you know objectively, and then you interface objectively, then you judge objectively, and you act subjectively. So it's like you see action as the only real way to impact the physical world in in a way that matters to you like you you get what oh, you, yeah. you want by taking action in the world I get what I want by knowing myself basically hmm. I get what I seek get what I seek by knowing myself, you get what you seek by taking action that impacts things. So for you, this is a very meaningful, uh, like, getting what you seek experience, probably, because you're taking action that nobody else has taken yet, uh, or maybe somebody else emailed me too, but um, you're the first one that I actually think I've done this with. So, you know, it's like, uh, oh no, I did do it with somebody else, but he didn't want me to film it. Uh, Oh, shit. (laughs) <laughs> oh god damn it Eric Thor don't be nice fucking Eric Thor being nice fucking INFJs <laughs> god damn it you're such an ass being nice to me like that you know it's gonna make me feel bad <laughs> fucking guy 
<laughs> Fucking INFJs. They're so tricky. It's, somebody was saying he... Somebody thinks he's an INTP. That guy is a straight-up INFJ. What do you think about Eric Thor? Langomorph. Um, Langomorph? I don't think of... I don't think I've seen enough of him to, to make that decision yet. Hmm. I, I think I might have seen like one video with him in it. I don't watch it, you know. Okay. Well, I guess if there's no last burning thoughts, then let's draw this video to a close. Maybe we can make another one if we feel like about another subject or whatever. But any last thoughts? Uh, not really. Just, uh, yeah, we're done. All right, cool. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to play the cheese.